This is Ari Koretsky, and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. We are back with another fabulous episode of Jews You Should Know. This week, such an interesting and different kind of guest, Enrique Sultan is the head of the Venezuelan Jewish community. And that is quite an interesting subject. Those not versed in the history of uh, Latin American, South American Jewry will learn quite a lot about it in this episode. It's struggles and challenges, but also it's proud legacy and really an incredible person and culture to learn about. Meanwhile, a reminder is always to follow us on social media. That's Jews You Should Know, spelled out fully on Instagram and Facebook. Jews You Should Know with the letter U on Twitter. Comments, questions, suggestions to Jews You Should Know at gmail.com. Please subscribe or follow wherever you're listening, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever it may be. Spread the word to friends and family as well. And now to our conversation with President of the Venezuela Jewish Community, Enrique Sultan. We are here with Enrique Sultan, coming to us from Caracas, Venezuela. Did I say that correctly, Enrique? Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm really excited to learn about your life as well as the Jewish community of Venezuela, which I know has changed a lot over the years. But first of all, how are you? I'm great. I'm feeling pretty good. Thanks for inviting me to your podcast. And of course, we were connected by the inimitable Jack Cohen, who is uh, probably my number one source of podcast guests. He is <laughs> constantly feeding me ideas and he's got amazing uh, connections and so forth. So I'm thrilled. And are you guys, you guys are family, right? Yes, he's my cousin. He's like my brother. Like your brother? Yeah. Him and Danny, we're all like brothers. Amazing. Give Jack a shout out. Thank you as always. And uh, let's take it from the top. Enrique, tell us a little bit about where you're from? Were you born in Venezuela? What was your early childhood like? Yeah, so I was born and raised here in Venezuela, in Caracas. And I grew up always inside our community. My parents were always very activist among the, the community. Most of the community went to the same school. We have one school, which is inside the JCC. What's it called? Uh, the school name is Morali Luces. Herzl Bialik, that's the name of the school. And the JCC, it's called Hebraica. So we went to school there from like 7.30 a.m. until 1.30 um, preschool and then mid school, middle school. And then from high school, we, we had classes until 3.30. So when we finished class, we all went together to Hebraica to do all kinds of activities, sports. And uh, the girls went and do Rikudim. Dancing. So basically, our whole life is we're inside Hebraica. Tell me a little bit about, I guess, the origins of the Venezuela community. Do you know much about the history? Where did, how long have Jews been there, and where did they come from? I think the first Jews that came to Venezuela were from Sephardic origin many, many years ago, in a small town, and that name was Coro. Okay, so basically the dates, I don't have it inside my mind right now, but I know that they established a Sephardic community, which is called the Asociación Israelita of Venezuela, which I am president right now. I just became president two days ago. Congratulations. Thanks. And the Ashkenazi community, and the, the name is Unión Israelita of Venezuela. So they were established many years ago. This community has the particularity that like we share the same school. Sharing the same school means that for most of our years, we don't make difference between Sephardic and Ashkenazim. So we all grew up together. We get married. It's a common thing for people to get married between our communities. We share the same school. Always we have our differences, but but it was a pretty nice community to live on from that point of view. So when did, when did the Ashkenazim start to come to Venezuela? The exact date, 
I don't want to say a date, but they came here and I know that they were the first to establish the school. I know that the, the Sephardic and Ashkenazi community became partners in the school years after they already established the, the school, which was first in San Bernardino, which was called Moraliluces. And then the, the family Benaim, they bought the, the land to make the JCC. One year before, they went to speak to the Shkenazim community to become partners. And then they built their, their other school and we became partners in everything. What about your family? When did your family originally? My grandma from my father's side, actually, she was born in Venezuela. My great grandfather, he came here very early. Then my grandfather, my grandfather from my father's side, he was born in Melilla, which is a small town from Spain that is actually on the Maroc on Morocco side. My mother was born in Tangier, like my grandfather and grandmother. And Tangier is a sta- is a small town north of Morocco. So all of your family came from Sephardic roots. Yes. Did you grow up hearing a lot about the history of the family and going back to Morocco and going back to those countries? Yeah, we were a pretty tight family. We, I was very close to my grandfather. He unfortunately passed away just a month before my bar mitzvah. So uh, I, I heard a lot of stories, still hearing a lot of stories of my family. I know that my great grandfather and his brother had a, a big company in Morocco. Um, they say um, whole grains and they own like the movies in, inside there. They love to do mitzvahs. They were great community guys over there. I always heard hear stories about them. So I know my, my uncle Jacob, he had to leave Morocco during the second war because he was the Nazis were after him. He went to New York. And then when the Jewish life became very intense in, in Morocco, my grandfather went to Spain for a couple of years, and then he, he came to Venezuela. That's from my mother's side. From my father's side, he did the army for, for Spain during the, the Civil War. And then he came also to Venezuela looking for a better future. Do you know why they chose Venezuela? I don't know, but I, I know Venezuela back then was a, a big country with great opportunities. So I know the thing is, I know both of my grandparents came to Venezuela and then they, they brought their brothers. They were like the first from their family to come. And I know that, that then the family came because we already have roots here. They already have business. They helped them build their own business, so they came. But I know my father from my father's side, my grandfather from my father and my mother's side were one of the first brothers to came. What, what did your family get involved with? What did they do when they came there? I guess they went into some kind of business? Yeah, they're, they're I don't know how to say it in English, but from my father's side, he sells they became business. They, they own stores in downtown and they, they sell different stuff. I would imagine most of, most of the people there do that, right? Most of the people who came or, or own their own business in downtown or they sell fabric. Fabric was also a, a pretty popular business back, back then. I guess uh, that, that has changed, right? That has changed. The economy has changed in Venezuela in the last couple of years. Uh, most of you know that we have a change of regime in 1998 when Chavez took over. And we've basically been having the same, the same politicians in power for the last 23 years, 24 years. So the first, the first years, economy-wise, were pretty good. But the last couple of years have been very hard. People from the community have been living... Venezuela for they are going to Israel to the to the United States Mexico Panama looking for better future so 
we became a, a much smaller community. We've been having our problems, but thank God for the last two years, I think we're on the right side of the track right now. Hopefully, we're getting better. We're getting better. So as you were growing up, what did you end up going to do? Did you, first of all, you, you had this, some Jewish education in the school, right? So yes. what's the family's like Jewish experience like? Are they, is it an observant community or most people uh, observing Shabbat or is it more, you know, they, they kind of are just in the community, but not so strictly observant. In our, our community is defined as an Orthodox community. Okay. When, when you go to a shul, to a temple, the, we have Orthodox rituals. Growing up, you see less observance from people. But the last couple of years, it's been growing significantly. I know that right now that I'm on the Sephardite community, I know that like last year we had like 200 Sukkot here during Sukkah, which is amazing. And I don't know the number what it was before, but we have here in Venezuela, we have four schools, all right? So we have one school that is for like the community school, which is a Raika, okay? Then we have a school that's from Lubavitch that goes from preschool to elementary school. We have a school that's only owned by, by the Sephardic community, okay? And we have a school that, that's like a, like a yeshiva, all right? So each school has its own observance level. So people choose. What is interesting is that we now have half of the people in the more observant schools and half of the people in the community school. So that speaks for itself. Right. But when you were growing up, there was only the community school, right? And then it was the, the other school, which is now owned by the Sephardic community, that's called Sinai. We have two growing up. The Sinai school has been always been more observant than the than the community school. But yes, right when I was growing up, like uh, me and a couple of friends were the only co-shirts in our year. But then, right now with my kids, that doesn't happen anymore. You see that they're more and more more keeping kosher. Yes, keeping kosher, watching Shomer Shabbat, that kind of stuff. So the community thing is becoming more traditional. Yes. For sure. So when you were growing up, what did you want to do? Did you also want to go into business? Did you want to sell fabrics? <laughs> what was your uh, what was your goals? So when I finished high school, I went to the university here in Venezuela to the metro. It's called Universidad Metropolitana. Um, yeah, I always wanted to go to work with my father. He has a a factory, Christmas factory. He sells garlands. And I wanted to work there for as long as I can remember. I met my wife. I, I, I actually went to school with my wife. And I started dating her one year after we left high school. So when I was finishing the university, I, I had to make a decision because we had to get married. So... We look at the options of or going to Spain or something else, but then we decided to stay here in Venezuela. So I, I w started working with my, fa with my father for like three months, and then I opened my own business. What kind of business? I start bringing Christmas decoration for, from China. Then I opened a, a home good business for around five to six years. And I also sell for two years. I also had a business selling floors like porcelain. porcelain. I, I love the idea that uh, the nice Jewish boy is the one selling the Christmas decorations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I went to China for the, for the fair, the Canton fair, it's funny because most of the people who work business, like in other countries, they're all Jewish. It was very funny. 
Unbelievable. <laughs> yes. God has a great sense of humor. <laughs> yes. So are you still doing that today or what, what business are you in now? Yeah, right now, my father retired like eight years ago. I work on the factory. We had to reinvent the business because here in Venezuela, the business as we knew, as we knew it, it wasn't working anymore. I traveled now to Colombia to sell the goods. And for the last couple of years, I've been opening a Christmas stores during the season. Tell me a little bit about what happened in Venezuela over the last, you mentioned it earlier a little bit, but what happened over the last number of years? There was a major change. Venezuela used to be a very successful and a wealthy country, right? Yes. And there was a major change because of the politics. What, what happened exactly that everything became so much more difficult? So we have the, the debt that the government created in the early years of, of the government was huge. They actually made the default and they didn't pay the debt. And that was a big problem. And I think with governments, the perception of trust is very important. So people stopped believing that Venezuela was a, a country that you can invest in. Private property didn't mean anything anymore here. You could lose your store, your land very easily. Why? Because if the government thought they could take it from you, they took it if they need it for something. So security-wise, if you went to the streets, you can get robbed, you can get kidnapped. And a couple of years ago, so people didn't want to live here anymore. Our community was very fast to react to it, and, and they left. Actually. I have two sisters that don't live here in Venezuela. My mother doesn't live in Venezuela. My grandma doesn't live in Venezuela. My uncles doesn't live in Venezuela. My father comes like for four to six months. And that's it. On my wife's side, they, they all live in Mexico also. And they all used to live in Venezuela, but they left. Yes. Because of the crime and, and the economy. Basically. So what did the community do to combat the crime you start hiring private patrols or i know like for example in south africa you know they're in like johannesburg there was a lot of crime and they have a community patrols and private security is it a similar situation we have private security here in our community during the worst years we had patrols around the jcc and around our temples but people got this life going and you're gonna cover the whole city so that make it really hard. But for the last two to three years, the, the crime has been going down. Thank God we haven't heard anything bad. And we're thinking that that's getting better. So a lot of people left the community. What did that, how did that change the community? Do you know how many Jews there were and how many left? I think we were around between 20 to 25,000 at some point here in Caracas. And right now we should be around five to six thousand. So it's really small now. It's not a small community because if you go to other countries here in South America, you can still hear about smaller communities, but it's not what we used to be for sure. But we still have we are a, a proud community. We have spectacular infrastructure here in Venezuela. We have a beautiful jcc we have four schools we have a lot of shoes we have kosher restaurants we have our beta boat we have migwe we have all the services you need to live a, a jewish life is it hard to sustain those institutions when you only have a quarter or a fifth of the population the biggest problem that we have here is that the people we, with money were the first to leave so our community is getting older and poorer. So it's been really hard to keep it up. Thanks God we have people with big heart here that still help us. We have uh, the joint 
that helped us a lot for the last couple of years and institutions outside that still care for our community. We were a very proud community. We help a lot to other communities around the world. During the difficult times in Israel, Venezuela was one of the biggest donors to, to Israel. So right now we're on the other side of the... And we don't know actually how to, how to do it, but I think we're getting the job done. Did the people who left, who you said were the wealthier families, did they continue to support the community in Venezuela? Most of them, yes, but it's been now, it's, it's passed a lot of years. So the economy right now uh, uh, around the world is not the best. And they start losing that attachment they had to, to your community. They said, look, I am already settled here in Miami. I already have my problems here. I, my kids go to school here. I cannot support your schools, stuff like that. But most of them, they still care. They still support us. Not like they used to. Each time it's, it's harder. It, I think it's normal. But that's life, I think. What's the relationship you mentioned Israel was when you were growing up, did people go to Israel frequently? Did you go to Israel growing up as a child? Yes, people were a Zionist also community. We, Israel is one of our main things here in Venezuela. Actually, right now, like 75 to 90 percent of the kids who, who graduate from high school, they go to Akshara, they go to one year to Israel. We have uh, also between 10th and 11th grade here in Venezuela, you go to, to Israel in an educational trip. And yeah, Israel is a big thing for us here in Venezuela. What was your first time going? The first time I went to Israel actually was for Jack Bar Mitzvah. Jack's Bar Mitzvah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Do you, what do you remember about it? No, it was a great, a great trip. We had, we went with our whole family. I remember Jack doing the bar mitzvah in the kotel. Then we went to a shul nearby the kotel. We went and, and visited Eilat, Tel Aviv. We stayed in Jerusalem. We went to the north, to Tiberias. It was a great trip. And how many times have you been back since then? Four or five times. My sister got married here like five years ago in Israel. That's the last time I went. Okay, so we got to get you back. Yeah, and, and I, I was going. I was going right now. Sarit is getting married. Jack's sister is getting married right now in in Israel. Two weeks from now, and I, I was going to go, but with with the presidency here, I cannot go, unfortunately. And we also have the Maccabi games, which is a big thing here in Venezuela. The Maccabi World Games starts on July 12th. So we're, we're sending from Venezuela like 100 athletes. Wow. It's a lot. It's going to be in Venezuela or? No, no. They're in Israel. Uh, the World, oh, the World Maccabi Games Israel. this year. Yeah. Tell me about the leadership structure in Venezuela. So how does it work? There's an official community board. Yes, yeah, so the Far Sephardic community has its own board. The Shkenazim community has its own board. They're like the owners of the community, okay? They share together some infrastructure, like the JCC, the Beit Avot, the school. They're owned by, by the community. We, we also have infrastructure outside the community, but let's say that the school, the JCC and the Beta Wad are owned by the two main communities. Okay, so they share a room which is called the Bata Keilot and they make their, their own decisions. The Bata Keilot, one year the president is the president of the Sephardic community and one year the president is the Ashkenazim community. All right? So the Sephardic community, they choose their board through vote, the same as the Ashkenazim community. And then you name voluntaries to go to the JCC and to school, and they make their, their own board, their own board. So how did you become to this leadership position? So actually, I started working like 15 years ago. When I finished the high school, I went to directly to work with the 
youth department in in the JCC. All right, I started working on a on a movement that's called Neurim. We did activities for kids between 15 to 17 years old. All right, Neurim. So I worked there for like three to four years. I became president of Neurim. Then I went to the uni- Jewish movement, university movement, which is called the Movimiento Universitario. We make activities for the whole Jewish kids in Venezuela who are in the in university age. We did parties, seminars, tried to make matchmakers, all right? And then I finished, I finished the university, I graduated, and I started working. I went like five to six years without working in my community. And then they called me back to become like the, to start working on the JCC for helping the, the young people, right? I worked there for like four years. Then I went to the financial department in, of the JCC and I became president of the JCC. I finished that presidency two years ago and they asked me if I wanted to, they didn't have anyone to to, to go over from the Sephardic community and they, they asked me if I could. I didn't want to because I needed some rest and I have some projects that I wanted to work with, but I understand that sometimes it's not the way you want it, it's the way, it's the way God presents to you stuff. And I think that if the community needs you, you have to work for your community. That's the way I grew up. That's the way my parents teach me. So I accepted it, the challenge, and here I am. What are the responsibilities specifically of the president in the community? I'm still learning about them. I thought <laughs> it was much easier that it actually is. It's nothing like the JCC. In the JCC, it was very complicated. But for sure, now you have much more responsibilities. You work here with with the people in need. I think that has to be one of the biggest responsibilities. You're responsible for the education of the whole community, for the security of the whole community. You're responsible that everyone gets paid. You have all the resources you need to finish the year. And you have to make sure that the JCC is working properly, the schools are working properly. The beta vote is working properly. Everyone's taken care of. Big responsibility. Yes. <laughs> but I have, a, I have a pretty good team with me. They're my friends. They're, they will help me. I'm not comfortable. I don't think comfortable is the word, but I'm pretty sure we, we're going to get the work done. What's the total budget for this operation? For the Sephardic community, which without the the schools and the JCC, it's about two million a year. And the schools are separate. Yes, they have to raise their own money. Well, we help them with the kids that the, the kids that they they cannot pay for school, which are from Sephardic origins. We pay for them, and the school have to raise money for themselves. The JCC works differently. The people who doesn't pay, they have to cover it by their own. Are you in touch with leaders from other communities? Is that part of the job as a president of the Venezuela community? Do you speak with other leaders in other South American countries or just around the world in general? I know people from from other country from other countries, but not from from my position right now for the JCC part. We keep in touch with organizations for sure. Most of all, the joint. We also get help from, we have a big Venezuelan community in Miami, which they help us a lot. They have their own fund to help us, which is called Friends of Yahat. And I know they work pretty close together with the Federation there in Miami. In Israel, we also know people, but right now for other communities, I cannot say, I've been two days in the work, <laughs> in business, so. Give me time. I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. You guys. I mean, I imagine that there's people in Israel, you know, people in the in the diaspora affairs ministry and, and things like that that are interested in being connected. For sure. We know people in, in, in the Sahnut. 
Like last week, we we had a Zoom meeting with them. So here in Venezuela, we don't have an Israel embassy. We lost that to this government many years ago. They turned against Israel. Is that why? Mm, I don't know if they became against Israel, but let's say they're more pro-Palestinian, right? And they cut ties with Israel. This is Chavez. Yes. And he also got ties with the U.S. We don't have a U.S. embassy here in Venezuela. So maybe right now they're, they're trying to get those not connected again. But I don't know how long will it take. And I, I don't know if they will be successful, but we have a Shalia here in Venezuela. Okay, so he's mainly the only representation we have from Israel here. Is it difficult, therefore, because of the lack of formal ties is it difficult to travel to israel or to the united states so to the, most of the most of the Sephardi community here they, they have spanish passport we can travel to the united states without a visa we, we have to to go online and make a process that's called the esta esta you fill a form online and you get an answer from 48 hours most of the people got direct access to the United States. And to Israel, if you have a European passport, you don't need a visa. And I know the embassies and the consulates in Panama, United States, Spain, they help us a lot for the people who doesn't have another passport to go to Israel. Uh, who are the, the rabbinic leaders in the community? Is it mostly Chabad over there or are there other leaders? No, no. The leader of the of the Sephardic community is called Rabbi Isaac Cohen, which is actually family of Jack and ours. He's been here in the community for 45 years now. He's a Dayan. He's the the main leader of the Sephardic rabbis for sure. Chabad has his own thing going on, and the Ashkenazim community has his rabbi also. They they also had a rabbi for many years, which is called Rabbi Brenner, who left to Miami, he retired, I don't know, if between eight to five years ago, and they have a, a new rabbi here. They have their own things going. Do the different parts of the community get along? I mean, it's a small community, so they, you would think everyone needs to work together, and it sounds like they do work together a lot. But we also know that Jews, <laughs> many times, you know, small community can still have lots of different you know, groups and factions and disagreements. So we have here a saying in Venezuela that says small children, small problem, big children, big problem. I think with the community, we can say small community, big problems. All right. So we used to get along much better than we do now. The last couple of years have been really hard, but one of our main goals is to make shalom again with the Ashkenazim community and to try to get along. We have to understand that we're like we're brothers. We cannot separate ourselves. So it's hard because we each have our own point of view. The main differences are when you speak about religion terms and the level of religion that you wish to have in school and in the JCC. But I think we have to learn from each other. We have to try to understand each other's point of view. And hopefully we, we get understanding. Yesterday, we started working on that. <laughs> Do you think that when the community was bigger, everyone like, had their own space so everyone could do what they wanted on their own? And now that it's smaller, everyone's on top of each other more. And it's, so it's, it's more difficult because you have to find an agreement. That could be it. I don't know what I don't know if the if the Orthodox level back then was the same as we are right now. So I was uh I'm 41 years old right now. We're talking I was maybe 15 to 18 years old. I have, I had no idea back then what was going on on our, on our community. But definitely when you're smaller, you have everyone on top of each other, everyone knows everything. And everyone wants to make their own point of view. So the world has changed 
in this topic, not only our community. We didn't have social media back then. Okay, social media is a very powerful tool, but you can use it for good or for bad. So social media has also taught us that you can go ahead and judge your friend or the other person without knowing what's going on in his life. You can write a Twitter saying whatever you want, a tweet or saying whatever you want, and no one's asking questions about it. So I think that has changed people's point of view, not only in our community, but worldwide. So what's your plan to try to bring more, you said, shalom, you know, more peace into the community? How are you going to do it? I will try to listen to their problems. I will try to make them understand our problems. And let's try to meet in the middle. And we cannot keep the community the same as it was five to 10 or 15 years ago, because one thing we learned from the pandemic is that the world has changed and you have to change with the world. You cannot keep with the status quo that you have five years ago. So if we're not the same, you're not doing the same business, you're changing everything. You cannot keep the community as it was. You have to evaluate what they need right now, the needs of the community are right now and make the changes according to the needs. And that's the biggest thing we have to work for sure. What do you find is unique or special about the Venezuelan Jewish community? You know, what do you love about the country and about the community? Venezuelan people are very warm people, all right? They make you feel at home right away. They're very friendly. When people from other countries come to visit us, Shlihim come, school teachers, rabbis, that's the first thing they tell you, okay? And our community in special, they have a big heart. So we can discuss if you want to put Tefilim today or not for many hours. But if someone comes and says that the Jewish people need help, and he doesn't have food to eat and he needs help in the hospital or something, we all come together right away to help. That's the, the main thing I love about our community. It's beautiful. Do people ever visit or nowadays it's too difficult or people have stopped coming? So it's very hard right now from the pandemic to travel to Venezuela. It's been harder. We only have connections with Turkey and Dominican Republic and Panama. And I think more and more every day they're starting opening again the flights. We don't have direct flights to the US. That makes it a little bit harder to come to Venezuela because it's more money, it's more time. When we have direct flights to Miami, it was in two hours, 45 minutes, you were in the States. Right now it's 12 hours for travel to Miami. It's crazy. You leave three hours before the airport to to the airport. You fly to Panama two hours, then the wait, then three hours more to Miami. It's 12 hours door to door. Makes it difficult. Yeah. What are your goals other than creating more peace in the community, which is, of course, perhaps the most important goal, but what are your other goals as president now in this uh, Venezuelan Jewish community? So we have to build, a, I think we have to build a better beta about for our elderly. An old age home. Yes. Solidify the, the education. Education is a priority for us. Jewish education and regular education. The best we educate our children, the better future we'll have for sure. And try to keep it up. Here we are juggling balls every time. So. We're taking a step at a time. Well, I wish you a tremendous success. Leading anything is difficult. Leading a group of Jews <laughs> <laughs> is even more difficult, especially when you have different groups, different factions. Are you optimistic for the future of Venezuelan Jewry? Do you think that the community can grow and develop? I'm very optimistic. One project we're, we're going to start work with is trying to get people back to Venezuela because I know people, Venezuelan people, are not having the easiest time around the world. So 
I think it's time to come back to Venezuela. We're ready for them. We're waiting for them. I think we have good opportunities here. And let's see. I'm optimistic by nature. I'm the only one of my family here. <laughs> Why are Venezuelans struggling around the world? Because I think the world it's really hard to be around right now. When you go when you're Venezuelan to go to the States, it's very hard to have a visa to get a, a legal status in the United States right now. It's very hard. So they go to school there, they graduate from school in the States and they don't have a, a visa to stay there to work. And they do all kind of stuff. Life is very expensive there. Most of our people live in Miami, which is not the best city to build a business around, but they all want to live there because they're used to living in community like in Venezuela and they don't, they don't think chances like Maryland. And I don't know, maybe other cities have more opportunities, but they all want to live in Miami, which I think makes it a little bit harder for the young people. Spain, they have it easier because they have the legal status, but in Spain, you don't have community there. So when, if we lose all the people to Israel, I'll be happy because that's our main goal, right? To go to Israel. Everyone should go to Israel. But when we lose it to other communities, we don't like it anymore. We have to fight the people who don't want to go to Israel and don't want to stay in Venezuela. We have to make a plan for them to stay. I know people already, for many, many years, every kid that graduated high school, they didn't come back. They went to all the places I named you. Right now, I think the kids are starting to come back to study here in Venezuela. And that's a big hit for us because if they come to study here, they graduate here, they start their life here. So for sure, they'll get married here and we'll get back to as normal as we were. But it will take time. Well, I love the blessing that everyone should go to Israel as the first goal, but if they can't, for whatever reason, then try to rebuild the community in Venezuela and Caracas. And it seems like the community has a wonderful advocate. Uh, you have the passion and the vision to try to build this back again. So Enrique, thank you so much for sharing a bit about your life story and, and about the country that you love. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. This has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at JewsYouShouldKnow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at Jews You Should Know. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Jews You Should Know. Finally, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to Jews You Should Know.